my favorite Christmas memories are, are family memories. And if you look in the lower left corner there, you can see, you can see me sitting there uh, with, I'm the fifth of six children. You can see the stockings hung by the chimney with care. My mom and dad did such a great job of making Christmas such a magical time. Just recently in church, we were all looking at the uh, Family Search app and uh, it was fun to see a picture of my mom and dad there. I'd like you to look at the date of my mom there, similar to Hank. Um, he lost his father in 2021. I lost my mother in 2020. And my mom was one of the most saintly people I have ever known. Super talented and just a delightful person. It was December 19th. So a year ago when my mom passed away, she was 90 years old. And I've wondered, have I lost the chance to give my mom a Christmas present forever? And no, because of the Savior, I still can. Now, a couple of years ago, I shared at one of these something I learned from William B. Smart. He wrote a church news editorial called The Three Levels of Christmas. Isn't that a great name, William B. Smart? Because doesn't it sound like your parents are telling you something? William, be smart. But William B. Smart wrote this very insightful idea about the three levels of Christmas. He said the first level is Santa Claus, and that's Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer and stockings and Christmas trees, and we love it, and we eat too much and spend too much, and we enjoy every minute of it, he said. He said, but there's a higher, holier level, and he called that the silent night level. And that's the story of, of Luke 2, Luke 1 that John just shared with us, a story of the shepherds and the angels and the announcements to the shepherds and everything. But then he said something, I thought, oh, that's so good. He said, but some want to keep Christ in the manger. And if we do that, we never get to the real level, the Christ the Lord level. And without that, none of these others would even be here. The Christ the Lord level, Jesus grew up, that baby in the manger grew up, increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man, it says, continues in Luke 2. And I love what C.S. Lewis said, to paraphrase C.S. Lewis a little bit, without Christ, it is always winter but never Christmas. Now, will I be able to, to give my mom a Christmas gift? Well, let me share some things that we know because of the Savior, because of the restoration. Joseph Smith said, I have a father, brothers, children, and friends who have gone to a world of spirits. They are only absent for a moment. They are in the spirit and we shall soon meet again. He also said, the spirits of the just are exalted to a greater and more glorious work. Hence, they are blessed in their departure to the world of spirits, enveloped in flaming fire. They are not far from us and know and understand our thoughts, feelings, and motions. And here's the part, oh, and are often pained. They're seeing what we're going through. Maybe sometimes it hurts, but I also think maybe that means they can rejoice with us as well when we do when we choose the right. I see that often pain there with, I think, have you ever wondered, oh, I wonder if my grandpa saw that, you know, <laughs> something on earth that you did. Thought, okay, that wasn't my best moment. Or maybe there's something wonderful and you think, oh, mom and dad, did you see that? I love what Joseph F. Smith said. I claim we live in their presence. They see us. They are solicitous for our welfare. They love us now more than ever. For now they see the dangers that beset us. They can comprehend better than ever before the weaknesses that are liable to mislead us into dark and forbidden paths. So, you know, maybe my mom and dad know more of my faults now. Uh, I always try to be the, the young man my mom thinks I am, the old man my mom thinks I am. She probably knows more now, but I love this hopeful message. They love us now more than ever. I have this on my wall at home. I have, in fact, I, this is the center of a frame with my family all about, and I tried to recreate it. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland said, don't underestimate your family on the other side of the veil. So I'd like to introduce them to you. This is my mom when she was a young adult, my dad when he was a young adult. This is mom and dad about the time that they met. Dad got home from World War II. This is mom and dad when they were dating and engaged. And then, of course, there is my grandpa and grandma, by the way, and my grandpa and grandma Jarman. And they're all gone. They're all on the other side. 
And I hope we take the chance while they're still here to thank them and tell them we love them. There is a poem that I used to love to read at funerals. When I quit this mortal shore and mosey round this earth no more, don't weep, don't sigh, don't sob. I probably have a better job. Don't go and buy a huge bouquet for which you'll find it hard to pay. Don't mope around and feel all blue. I'm probably better off than you. If you have Roses, bless your soul. Just put one in my buttonhole while I'm alive and well today. Don't wait until I've gone away. So give me all my flowers today, whether pink or white or red. I would rather have one blossom now than a truckload when I'm dead. <laughs> so tell them we love them now, but you know, we're going to see them again. And they're watching us and they, I think, can feel joy. Christmas is so often described as glad tidings of great joy. It's such a great phrase. Glad tidings, good tidings throughout the scriptures are almost always about Christmas. Not in every case, but a lot of times it's about the birth of Christ. It is glad tidings, which means good news, which means gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it brings great joy. And Jesus came and because of that, I can see my family again. Now, those phrases have such power that commercially they try to use them too. I was at my favorite grocery store and saw these items in a bag. Look at this. Glad Tide of Grape Joy. Huh? Clever, right? Now, I asked them, how much is that? And they said, well, that costs gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Anyway, we know the Christmas story. We know the hymn, Joy to the World the Lord has come. I'm thankful that up there in heaven, the angels are thinking, hey, what can we do to bring some joy to those folks down there? Sometimes angels have that job. Sometimes they come down to scold, as we know, but sometimes they come down to bring us joy, and they almost always start with fear not. You guys are too afraid down there. Stop it. Faith, right? Fear not. We have come to bring joy. So I've wondered, is there a way that we can return joy to not just dishwashing liquid, but we can return real joy to those who are gone, our family who are gone. President Benson said, I'm sure that many of you, many of you know, the veil can be very thin. There are people over there who are pulling for us, people who have great faith in us, who have great hopes for us, who are hoping and praying that we will measure up. Our loved ones, parents, grandparents, brothers, sisters, and friends who have passed on. Is there a way we can return the joy? And there is, thanks to the Savior. And he describes it. Here's one place where the Savior describes it. It's in a parable of parables of lost things in Luke chapter 15. Now, if you want to know the meaning of a parable, Joseph Smith said, what was it that drew the parable out of Jesus? Well, here's how Luke 15 starts. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. So to eat with somebody was really to affirm them and to accept them. And they're saying, Look, this Jesus, he eats with them. He accepts them. And Jesus, you can almost imagine him just saying, oh, Seriously? Or behold, seriously? And then he explains the parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and even the lost sons, the prodigal son and his brother, are kind of both lost if you read it. But I, I love this. And you know you know the story. What man among you, if he loses a sheep, if he has a hundred sheep and he loses one, I'm going to read it exactly so I don't get it wrong, doth not leave the ninety and nine and go after that which is lost until he find it. And when he hath found it, he layeth on his shoulders rejoicing. There's that word joy. When he cometh home, he calleth his friends and neighbors and say, rejoice with me, I have found my sheep which was lost. So this is the next verse. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over 99 just persons which need no repentance. We can create joy in heaven. And then Jesus continues either. What woman having 10 pieces of silver, if she lose one, doth not light a candle, sweep the house, and seek diligently until she find it. When she hath found it, she calleth her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, I found the peace which I had lost. And there it is again. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. So one way we bring joy to heaven is we repent. <laughs> You're thinking, repent? That's one of those words. I put it in my chat window when I'm doing a Zoom class. Here's this word, repent. What's your first reaction? 
you know, because it kind of can sound like scolding. I love what Elder Holland said. He said, perhaps repent is perhaps the most hopeful and encouraging word in the Christian vocabulary. Just the fact that we have an opportunity to repent gives hope and encouragement. And the fact that we can go back every week to the sacrament table, what a blessing, what a hopeful, encouraging thing. Repent brings joy in heaven. Another thing we can do is to testify, to share our testimony. And that doesn't mean, I mean, some of you listening, you're going to school. I, I don't mean that you get up in the cafeteria and announce, I would indeed be ungrateful if I didn't stand on my feet this day. But you could say something as simple as, man, seminary was good today. And that's the way you're testifying. What's seminary? Oh, just, I have this class from my church. I go over there. It's so good. I, I just really loved it today. It's easy to share, to testify. And what happens when we, what happens in heaven when we testify, when we share our testimony? Here's another one. You, ye are blessed for the testimony which ye have borne is recorded in heaven for the angels to look upon. Ever thought about that? People are recording our words, and they rejoice over you and your sins are forgiven you. Now, this is to returning missionaries. Maybe it applies to testimony meetings as well. The angels recorded it. They look upon it and they rejoice over you and your sins are forgiven you. Maybe there's another way President Nelson kind of outlined a couple of months ago in general conference. Make time for the Lord. If most of the information you get comes from social or other media, your ability to hear the whisperings of the Spirit will be diminished. My brothers and sisters, I plead with you, President Nelson said, to make time for the Lord. Notice this verse in the Doctrine and Covenants about bringing joy in heaven. This is to Warren Cowdery. Again, verily I say unto you, there was joy in heaven when my servant Warren bowed to my scepter and separated himself from the crafts of men. In other words, he made more time for the Lord. So you can put your own name name in there. When my servant John, that's my name, bowed to my scepter, separated himself, herself, when you put your name in there, from the crafts of men and making more time for the Lord. Again, President Nelson, my dear extraordinary youth, you were sent to earth this precious time, this most crucial time in the history of the world to help gather Israel. There's nothing happening on earth that now that is more important than that. There's nothing of greater consequence, absolutely nothing. And I know you might be thinking, I, I, well, I don't even know, what, gather Israel. I'm not even sure what that means. I, I'm just a kid. Well, President Nelson continued, Any anytime you do anything that helps anyone, notice this, on either side of the veil, take a step toward making covenants with God, receiving their essential baptismal and temple ordinances, you are helping to gather Israel. So, can teenagers do this? One day I was home and my son had just got home from school and suddenly he ran out the front door with a suit on. I'm like, where are you going? And this a wonderful mom in a minivan pulled up and there were a bunch of other boys all dressed up in the van and they took off and then she texted me this picture. So what did they all do? Oh, they had an appointment and they ran down to the temple and decided to help gather Israel on the other side of the veil. And this sister that texted me, she said, watching these boys baptize each other was so inspiring. I thought, yeah, it's so great. And then, of course, they got done and came out and got another picture and went and had pizza. Um, there's a lot of things you could do on a Friday night, but this, this one's pretty cool. So Horace Cummings recorded in his journal, that Joseph Smith said concerning the work for the dead, Joseph said in the resurrection, those who, who had been worked for would fall at the feet of those who had done their work, kiss their feet, embrace their knees, and manifest the most exquisite gratitude. The prophet added, we do not comprehend what a blessing to them these ordinances are. So I think I seen people and some of you that spend every day in the temple, some of these wonderful folks that uh, retired now, whatever, and they work so hard. And imagine the joy they're creating on the other side, <laughs> the welcome they're going to get. They're going to be gang tackled, but it won't hurt because you're resurrected, it sounds like. So what, what an amazing thing to look forward to. Anytime you do anything that helps anyone on, the other, on either side of the veil, 
That's where temple work comes in. Take a step toward making covenants. Doesn't mean get all the way there, but even take a small step. You're helping to gather Israel and you're creating joy in heaven. Well, my mom and dad are not here on earth anymore, but they have not been taken off my Christmas list. I'm so glad that my parents are together now. My dad's been been gone since 2004. In fact, I remember giving him a blessing before he passed away, not right like right before, a few years before, and I I gave my dad a blessing, which was a great privilege, and he turned around and he looked at me and he said, "John, I think I'm going to hell." And I was like, dad and he said to teach and i was like oh okay <laughs> so so dad is in the hell spirit prison mission and now he's got a new companion and that's mom and these two i will never underestimate my family on the other side of the veil well christmas such a joyous time is there a way that we can return to sender some of that joy yeah we can we can repent the most hopeful and encouraging word in the Christian vocabulary, and that sends them joy. We can testify, we can share with our friends, our neighbors, what we love, what's brought us joy, that brings joy in heaven. We can help to gather Israel. I hope at this wonderful time of year, you will feel the joy of the Savior and send some of that joy back to your loved ones with whom one day we will be reunited again. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.